For those of y'all who don't know me, since I know I'm still pretty new, um, my name is Jake Petty. I'm the high school director here. Uh, like I said, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 14 and go through the end of the chapter. Is that giving me some feedback? Thanks, brother. Um, I'm a little ashamed to admit this to y'all, but the first time that I read The Lord of the Rings, I was a fifth grader, and um, about two-thirds of the way through the second book, I was so anxious, and I was in so much despair over how things were going that I went and found the third book, and I skimmed through until I could find to see whether or not the good guys won. I could not wait to read the entire thing. I was so anxious. All of the good, powerful guys were out of the picture, and we were left essentially with two rather non-extraordinary hobbits who were being led into a trap um, by an evil river dweller and a spider, and it did not look like there was any hope. All of the obvious reasons to hope had disappeared. Right, and, and nobody in the fellowship, nobody in the planning could have seen this coming, but, but there were actually two things that were crucial to victory. There were two things that were really crucial to rescue, and I, I think that's one thing that makes this story so profound and, and something that we are actually going to see in this text today. Although I love the way that, that Token draws it up, it's that evil and ordinary were two really necessary elements to the plan. Right? All, of, all of the planning, all of the horses and chariots and powerful wizards and kings and princes, none of them could save the world. It took the bad guys having the upper hand for a little bit. It took two very ordinary hobbits or halflings. Right? It, it took all of that to get to Mount Doom. The saving of the world required a little evil and a little boring for the plan to work. It really, truly required all things to work together in a perfect mystery. And we're going to see that same thing in our text today. So if y'all will, if y'all will look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting in verse 14, I'm going to read through the end of the passage. Listen carefully, for this is God's word. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent to them by David his son to Saul. And, Saul. and David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David remain in my service for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, come on. Uh, would you all bow your heads and pray? Dear Lord, we thank you that you gave us your word. I, I do not feel like I have words sufficient for tonight. So I pray that you would speak through me that that my words would fall to the ground, blow away, and be remembered no more, but that your words would remain and that they would change us. We love you, Lord. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. So this passage begins with the Spirit of the Lord departing from Saul. Remember, God has decided to end Saul's reign, and he has, at the end of the last passage, he has sent 
his spirit to rush upon David, right? We are standing at a turning point in the book of 1 Samuel, right? Saul's trajectory away from the throne is crashing down and, and David's is on the rise. And this right here is the intersection of those two points, right? Saul's trajectory is down. David's is up. Now, in the Old Testament, the spirit of the Lord falling upon someone or departing from someone did not have to do with salvation. This is something that I want to get out of the way because I think it's really important for how we understand our text today. It was, it was not like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we see in the New Testament. The Lord's spirit in the Old Testament was a spirit of empowerment. It would fall or clothe or rush upon or rest upon judges and prophets and kings as a means of God empowering them to do his work. I say all of this because although God has very clearly given up on Saul as king, I, I do not believe that God has given up on Saul as a person. And that is a necessary foundation for understanding this strange thing that happens next. If you look at the text, it says, a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Some of your translations, if you're, if you're looking at your Bible, might say an evil spirit. Some of them uh, might say a distressing spirit or a spirit of fear. Right? And all of these descriptions have some merit, but the point is clear and it's highlighted by Saul's advisors. This harmful, tormenting, dangerous, evil spirit was sent by God. And I think that that opens up a, a really scary door if we look at it for just a second. And, and so I want to I ask you all, as, as we begin today, what role does God play in our suffering? I don't know all of the suffering of everybody in this room. I don't, I don't know what things have come your way. But I want to ask, what, what role does God have to play in all of this? Because it's very clear that God is sending suffering directly to Saul right here. Is every bad thing sent by God? Is he responsible causing each and every one of them or, or just some? Does he send anxiety and depression but not hurricanes or cancer? Or what about car accidents or breakups, right? Where do we draw the line? Where do we assign blame to God? Right? Is the world just so broken that some suffering is bound to happen and, and God is powerless to stop it? Or, or does God allow it? Right? Is, is, is all suffering punishment or is it, is it random? These are hard questions and, and I think that it's, it's good for us to ask, would it, would it make us more comfortable to think about the idea that, that our suffering came from God? Would it, be, would it be more comfortable for us to imagine that it came from him or that it came to us and God couldn't stop it? All right now, this text, I don't believe, answers all of those questions. And I don't want to ask this passage to do too much. If you want to have some of these conversations, um, you can talk to Ben and I. I'm not forcing any of our other volunteers to try and explain the relationship between God and suffering if they don't want to. Um, but we can, we can call upon a variety of scripture to round out our understanding of how God interacts with our suffering. And in general, I don't think that the biblical authors were too concerned with explaining that relationship too directly. On, on one hand, God was in control of all things. And on the other hand, our sin clearly caused the brokenness in the world. So on, on one hand, God is responsible. On one hand, we are responsible. Both are true. I do, however, believe that from this text, we can say one thing for sure. And that is that our loving, faithful God uses all things. All things. Not just the triumphant, but the terrible. Not just the, the beautiful, but the boring. Our God uses all things evil and ordinary for our good and for his glory. Now, let, let's look back at the text for a second. And upon seeing Saul's distress, his servants immediately realize that this was an evil spirit from God and they can find a cure. Right? Behold now, it says, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. 
Let our Lord, a.k.a. you, Saul, now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre, and you will be well. The authors of the Bible and, and the people in this day, like I said earlier, were not afraid to gather up all of the sufferings of life and say, these came from the hand of God. Right? There's no need to defend God's goodness in the face of tragedy. Right? Job, do you all know who Job is? Right? Upon having his children murdered and his livestock burned to death and his body covered in sores, Job says, will we receive good from God and will we not receive evil? Receiving evil was a perfectly reasonable part of life for Job. In the book of Ruth, do you all know the book of Ruth? Right? Ruth's mom, Naomi, mother-in-law, Naomi. Um, after her husband and two sons die, she says in very dramatic fashion, you shall no longer call me Naomi, you shall call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Lord has dealt bitter with me. I went away full and the Lord brought me back empty and the Lord has brought calamity upon me. Right? It didn't change whether or not they saw God as good or faithful or committed to his promises. They just knew that everything came from the hand of God. And Saul's servants here are no different, right? And an evil spirit is upon their king. Where else would it have come from other than directly from the hand of God? But like I said, right, they instantly find a cure. Right? And, and this part is almost comical to me. Right? As soon as Saul is afflicted, he is diagnosed and there's a solution. Right? The servants aren't worried or confused. They treat it like a common cold or something. They're just like, oh, yep, Saul, classic evil spirit from God. We'll find a kid that can play the harp and you'll be right as rain, I promise. Right? And it, it makes you wonder, like, was, was God's wrath thwarted that easily? Was, was God trying to punish Saul? And when he, he realized that they had found this loophole, like he was furious? Right? If God really wanted to make Saul suffer, couldn't he have come up with something a little bit more difficult than this, right? It's like God plays the evil spirit torment card, and they play the music played by a liar, and then all of a sudden Saul's fine, right? It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Or... Maybe did God design this punishment with a, with a purpose? Was his, his mercy maybe mixed in with his judgment in a special way? Quick story. Um, I've planted one garden in my life. Me and my best friend, RJ, we were fresh out of college, living in a, a big bachelor house on a pretty good-sized piece of land in, in Birmingham. Did, did any of y'all's families have gardens? Y'all have gardens? I don't, I don't know if... Okay, wow, that was a whole lot of hands in the back, right? Um, we really wanted to be farmers, and we realized that planting a garden was the closest thing that we were going to get. So we threw on our, our overalls, and, and we got to work, right? But uh, the ground where we wanted to plant the garden was, was really rocky. Like The first few inches of it were pure cement, and... Any rainwater that was going to come was going to slide right off the surface. It was going to have no chance of getting down to the seeds. So, so we grabbed a couple of hard rakes, and, I mean, we just beat the crap out of it. We beat, we beat up the ground. We tore it up. You would have thought we were angry at the ground. We were digging and raking and tearing the whole thing up, right? Because we knew that that was the only way that the water was going to soak down to the good soil. And... Uh, we were not successful farmers. The only thing that we managed to grow was kale, which we <laughs> decided we didn't actually want to eat, but we just, we just had buckets of it. Um, but uh, but we, we realized something that I, I think helps us make sense of this text. Um, in the same way that, that we tore up the hard surface of the ground that the water might seep in, I do believe that the Lord loves us enough to tear up the hard surface of our hearts so that his kindness can sink down into it. All right, Saul's heart, as you'll remember, was rock hard. Saul's heart was full of pride. 
He wouldn't repent. He couldn't see the sin in his own life. He looked at the Lord and he said, I do not need you to govern this kingdom. Right? And yet this harmful spirit that God has sent to him forces him every single day to sit there and receive the kindness of David. Right? And we know from verse 18 that the Lord is with David. The Lord is with him in this healing music. And so Saul, who has repeatedly rejected God, is now forced every single day because of this affliction to just accept a little bit of the Lord each and every day. God is afflicting Saul with one hand, and he's bringing in kindness with the other hand. He's tearing up the soil, and he's sending down the rain in one fell swoop. God is He's punishing Saul, but he's also pursuing Saul. And, and David would describe this exact phenomenon in, in Psalm 119, 75, and 76, where he writes that, In faithfulness, Lord, you have afflicted me. Now let your steadfast love comfort me. There's a pattern that we can start to see in the way that God works, where affliction and affection, where Calamity and comfort where, where misery and mercy are administered side by side. Right? This is the way that our God softens hearts. This is the way that he afflicts us in love, committed to our good. If y'all have your Bible still open, I would love to briefly flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In it, you'll find one of my favorite passages in Scripture and what I thought was the turnkey for understanding what is happening going on here in 1 Samuel 16. Right? In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul, who used to be named Saul, and who was also a very powerful Israelite reader or leader, he writes that in order for God to keep him from becoming too prideful, God sent a messenger of Satan to harass him. He sent a thorn in his side. Right? God sent an evil spirit to torment Paul in the exact way that he sent an evil spirit to torment King Saul. And it was for Paul's good. It was to soften his heart. It was to keep him from pride. Pride is, pride is like a raincoat. It's, it's like a raincoat that keeps the kindness of the Lord sliding off of our backs. Right? And instead of sending a musician, though, as a, as a means of grace for, for Paul with this thorn in the side, God simply says to him, my grace, Paul, is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Right? Therefore, Paul can boast all the more gladly of his weaknesses. He says that he can be content in weaknesses, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, right? That's a lot of big words of Paul saying that he can be content with any sort of suffering that the Lord sends his way because he knows that when he gets the affliction from God, he gets the loving kindness from God in the other hand. He knows that the thorn in his flesh is a thorn of kindness, right? Back to, back to 1 Samuel 16, the harmful spirit, I don't believe, was God's way of lashing out at a king who had turned away from him. It was, it was God's way of forcing Saul to receive his kindness and calling him to repentance. He was teaching Saul to throw himself upon the grace of another. This harmful spirit wasn't pushing Saul away. It was, it was actually calling him home. Right? We learn a, a lot about being humbled and receiving kindness in suffering. The, the silliest but truly like most impactful way for me to think about this in my life is to think about when I don't have a car, when my truck is in the shop, and I'm forced to just sit around and beg people to drive me places. It's humiliating. Right? You feel so powerless and so out of control. I, I cannot count the number of miles that I have walked through the cold in the rain because I'm just too prideful and unwilling to accept kind rides from other people. Right, but in, in affliction, yeah, even in affliction, he's, God is saying, let me teach you to cast yourself on the kindness of another. Let me bend you into a position to receive grace. I think, though, 
in this text, God was doing something else as well. If, if y'all will look with me back at verse 21. It says, And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. Right, the sending of the harmful spirit wasn't just softening the heart of Saul because the Lord wasn't just pursuing Saul. It was a part of his grand plan to pursue his chosen people. Right, one harmful spirit leads to a diagnosis, leads to a cure, leads to one of the servants who has seen David playing music, leads to a, a call to Jesse, leads to Jesse sending a donkey, and before you know it, the, the next king of Israel, who Saul would have certainly killed if he had any idea what was going on. The next king of Israel, David, has gone from the pasture all the way to the palace. Right? This was an undercover operation, if there ever was one. Like, so undercover that I don't even believe David knew what was going on, right? We don't really have any reason to believe from the end of the last passage that David knew that his anointing was for a kingship, right? If he did, then being sent to go play music for the mad king would have been a death sentence as far as he knew. But I think it's a lot more likely that, that David was anointed and then he walked back out to the pasture and he spent years watching sheep, playing music, watching sheep, playing music, getting in fights with his brothers and, and wondering what all of that insane business was with the prophet those years ago and and now God has, has called him to the palace and I think David spent almost the entirety of that time completely unaware that God was working everything into place for the salvation of Israel right God uses Saul's bad mood and David's love for music to move him from pasture to palace when we know that God could have struck Saul dead right he could have just placed David on the throne. He could have come to all of Israel in a whirlwind and said, the next king over you shall be my servant David. But God chooses to work in these mysteriously boring and ordinary ways. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't come to us on the clouds? Why God doesn't come to us in a, a pillar of fire or a whirlwind? speak out of the mouth of a lion? Why, why God doesn't do these things to show us who he is? Do any of y'all know what, what sky riding is? It, I know that y'all live far from a beach, but if, have y'all ever seen somebody sky riding with a plane? You're laying there on the beach and, and you look up and there's a, a little man in a prop plane and he's spelling out like Captain Carl's Seafood Buffet. And you're like, I have to go there. Right? It's like you see it written in the clouds and you're like, I have to go there. That must be true. Like somebody put in so much work for that. Why can't God do that? Why couldn't God come to us in miraculous fashion? Why does he choose these ordinary ways? Why does, why does he send harmful spirits and, and use little boys who are into music? Why, why does he do this? And I think we get a glimpse of that answer in a story that echoes the one that we have before us. That's the story of Joseph from Genesis. Do y'all do remember Joseph and the coat of many colors? Right, it starts, starts in Genesis 37, and, and Joseph has a bit of his own anointing experience. He gets, a, he gets a, a series of visions, and he finds out that one day he will be a ruler. One day his brothers will bow down to him. And... Unlike David, who just got to go back out to the pasture after his anointing ceremony, the next 13 years of Joseph's life were, were pretty bad. David was left in the field. Joseph was left for dead. He was sold into slavery. He was wrongly accused and imprisoned. And, and 13 years after that little anointing, he found himself locked in an Egyptian prison for a crime that he didn't commit. But then in chapter 41, the pharaoh of Egypt, he has a troubled spirit. Right, does that sound familiar? Right? The, the pharaoh is afflicted with a troubled spirit. And, and instead of looking for a musician, he, he goes to his servants and he says, find me someone who can interpret dreams. 
And that person was Joseph. Right? God, he pulled David from the pasture to the palace with a, with a troubled spirit and Saul, and he pulled Joseph from a prison to a palace with a troubled spirit and the Pharaoh, all so that Joseph could rise to number two in the land and save God's people from starvation. He saved the elimination of God's people, right? At the end of his journey, you can find this in Genesis 15, Joseph was able to look at his brothers and he was able to say, you meant all of this for evil, but God meant this for good. Right? Basically, he's saying, you did all of these things to me with, with evil intentions. God did all of these things to me with good intentions. God took his enslavement, his imprisonment, his years of suffering at the hands of deceit and lies. God took all of that evil. He mixed it with a troubled spirit and he created a salvation for his people. Right? Joseph could look backwards and see that. Joseph could look backwards at the evil and the ordinary and say, God, you meant that for good. But throughout the journey, he couldn't look and say, you mean this for evil. This is how God is going to use this for good. He could only look backwards and say it. God didn't give him a road map. Had God come to Joseph or had God come to David or had God come to us with a road map of how he was going to use all these things, he could give us a sweet gift. He could give us the gift of relief. But he'd be depriving us of a much more serious gift. The sweeter gift of faith. All right, faith is what you get when you walk through the ordinary, trusting that God is who he says he is, receiving affliction from one hand and sweet, comforting love from the other. That is the gift of faith. That's the gift that the Lord desires to give to us. That's why he works through the ordinary and the evil, so that we can have this gift of faith that is tested comes out to be purer than fine gold. One of, my, one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry, he describes faith like this. He says, faith is not necessarily, or at least not soon, a place to rest. Faith puts you on a wide river in a boat, in the fog, in the dark. If you've ever been in a small boat on a wide river in the fog and in the dark, it is a terrifying place to be. Everything in you is holding on to the sides of the boat. That's the gift of faith that God desires to give to us. So what do we, what do, we do with this, Jake? What, when we're faced with suffering, do we try to use God's eyes to see what good he is bringing about? When we are dealing with ordinary events in our lives, do we try and figure out how God is going to weave all of these pieces together as a part of his master plan? Or do we look backwards? like Joseph did. I think that we look backwards to our true and only comfort and proof that God is indeed loving, kind, and faithful. We have to look to Jesus. This has been a, a hard sermon for me to work through because at the end of it, all I want to tell you is that we have to look to Jesus. That's it. Jesus is the living proof upon which we gaze that God uses all things, that God really uses all things, evil and ordinary and mysterious. God really uses all things for good. That promise in Romans 8.28 that we love to quote, God uses all things for the good of those who love him, right? It's not that God just uses beautiful or triumphant or victorious things. God uses all things. God uses your sin and your pain Right? He chose, a, he chose a manger instead of a palace to be born into. Christ, he, he was a carpenter and not a king. He, he chose a cross instead of a throne. The Father didn't just send a harmful spirit after him. The God of heaven sent Roman soldiers after him, not just to torment him, but to torture him and to crucify him. Right? God used Spears and swords in the hands of evil men to work the greatest good of all time. Truly, truly, we can say what the enemy meant for evil at every turn. God, the whole time, meant for good. Right? God comforted Saul with the sweet relief of music. But when, when Jesus looked to the Father for comfort, he found none. 
The father turned his face away and, and Jesus received the entirety of God's wrath on the cross so that we might be able to today say with complete certainty that he who did not spare his only son, will he not then graciously and certainly give us all things? So if you are suffering today, if you're anxious or grieving, if you are sick or you are lonely or you are hurting, if evil is beating you down, if if God himself is afflicting you, throw yourselves into the arms of Christ. Throw yourselves into the arms of Christ. As, as Spurgeon said, learn to kiss the waves that cast you against the rock of ages. Right? The punishment for your sins was already paid upon the cross. God is not asking you in his punishment to make you pay that price again. Right? You are not feeling God's wrath, but his love. These light and momentary afflictions are a daily invitation to receive his grace, a sharp and loving reminder to return to him. Right? Better, better to be tormented by a hundred evil spirits and have a soft heart. Better to be cut and bruised a thousand times over that we might run back to the Father than to walk unscathed through life into hell. Right? Let him soften your heart. He will uphold you with his steadfast love. And if today you are overwhelmed by the ordinary, bored and unable to see God's hand at work, I beg you to look to Christ and see how God delights to pair majesty in the mundane. That is God's way. The king of heaven confining himself to the body of a crying baby, walking around with a 13-year-old with, with knees that skinned and feet that smelled. He used mangers and fishing boats and mustard seeds and a wooden cross to bring about the most spectacularly divine salvation that the world could have never seen coming. I want to, I want to finish by telling you a story. Um, the most impactful event that I have ever been to in my life was the, the funeral for my best friend's mom. This was a, a few years back. My, my best friend's mom passed after a long battle with cancer. And the lady who came up to give the eulogy, she said, I don't know how to describe this to you, but Miss Anita, Miss Anita was my friend's mom. Miss Anita served bigger God than I served. She, she says, I know that doesn't make theological sense. We both worshiped the same God, but Miss Anita served a bigger God because she saw God in smaller things. She served a bigger God because she saw God in smaller things. She sat in traffic and she saw the Lord's hand at work. She walked to the grocery store. She saw the Lord's hand at work. Over dinner with friends, over arguments with enemies, at, at baseball games and at dinner parties. She saw the Lord's hand at work. There was, there was no part of her life too small where she did not see God's hand moving. And because of that, her God was that much bigger. She said, she said my God, I mostly confine him to just taking care of my salvation, to securing my future in heaven. He does those things. Right, but, but Miss Anita, he saw God, and she saw God in the small things. She saw God in the ordinary. And when we see God in the small things, we get a big, big, big God. Y'all would bow your heads and, and pray with me. Dear Lord, I, I thank you that, that you speak to us through your word. I pray that in affliction from your hand and in the ordinariness of everyday life, we would see the way that you are working for our good. We would see the way that, that your loving hand sends affliction and sends comfort in pursuit of us. We would see the way that your loving hand moves all things for, for the good of our salvation, for the good of the rescue of this world. We love you, Lord God, and we pray that we would be able to see your bigness and your sovereignty today. Pray all of this. 
In Jesus' name, amen.